your Bible. <laughs> There's one to be one there, hopefully. The one we're missing. This is the day that the Lord has made. It's rejoice. Be glad in it. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to all of our congregants, our friends, visitors. Um, at the end of each pew is a little black book. If you wouldn't mind just noting the fact that you're here. If you are a visitor and want us to contact you, uh, please put your, some contact information in there so that we can do that. Announcements, uh, you can read most of them, on, all of them in fact, on the back of, your, of the order of worship, but I would bring your attention to the fact there is a congregational meeting right after the service. John will play a brief twiddly piece on the organ and then we'll start the meeting. Uh, Wednesday is last Wednesday fellowship. Dinner starts at six. Um, we're happy that uh, we have our visiting pastor today David Sawyer, I keep, I keep, I'm almost ready to call you Tom, but I won't. Uh, never he's, he's never heard that in his life yet. He's, he's a preacher's kid. His father was a Presbyterian minister and a Navy chaplain. Imagine that. Um, his mother, having put all of her husband and kids and all the others through school, decided she would get her own education and didn't stop. And she had earned, earned a PhD in agronomy from Auburn. So obviously a bunch of achievers. He's been married to Harriet for 45 years. That's an achievement. And they have two children, Beth and Wilson, and two grandchildren. The Sawyer kids were baptized in this sanctuary, and their daughter, Beth, was married here. David, he's re been retired since 2008 after serving First Pres in Spring Hill for 27 years, which is a lot. Good for you. Take a bow. You need to. <laughs> his only position as an ordained minister, he now splits his time between fishing, walking, moonshine, the dog, and acting like he's deaf, I, I love this, when he hears a sentence beginning with, what you need to do is, <laughs> we've never been there, have we? No, for a time. Well, while we're still in a good mood, um, this is the time, this is the time for joys and concerned. Uh, if you would, if you have a joy, speak up so we can hear you. Because sure, I'm deaf, but I think there are other people who are too, and we're not mic'd out in the congregation. So if you have something you're excited about, let us know. Any joys? Yeah, be shy. Don't. Are we all to pray? George, celebrated a wonderful wedding anniversary, being model suicide. Amen. Can you remember? You do. George said All right. 50 plus years of marriage and bliss. George and Linda are happy. Take a bow. Good job.
Before we go to the call to worship, I want to uh, tell y'all appreciate being here. Appreciate y'all having me. You've gone through me before, and you had to actually ask me back, so that's uh, that's good. I also want to let you know that the uh, young woman who is going to be moderating session and your congregational meeting was my clerk of session at Spring Hill. And I speak for Chris Adams, who's a minister down in Spring Hill. You can't have her. <laughs> she made everything run good and smooth in session, despite the moderator. I can tell you that right now. So I'm, it, was, it was great to see uh, Shelby and Chase, Chase, her husband, who, who I married, by the way. I, 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 can, I am proud of that. All righty. Let's join together in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to God all the earth. Sing to the glory of the Lord's name. Give to God the glorious praise. All the earth worships Let us stand and, and join in worship together by singing hymn number 307, God of Grace and God of Glory. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Let us ask God to forgive us. O oh God, you have given us so much. Our lives are filled to overflowing. We have your promise of life, and we are part of your community where we may act on your gracious promise. 
when we fail to live up to the best that is in us, or when we forget to reach out in love to one another, forgive us and guide us back to your way. Teach us to care for one another and for everyone we meet so that the whole world may come to know that in you we find true life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May it As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us offer the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning. The first reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, 16 through 19. In your Bible, it's the Old Testament, page 163. Listen for the word of the Lord. Do not put the Lord your God to test as you tested him at Massah. You must diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees and his statutes that he has commanded you. Do what is right and good in his sight, in the sight of the Lord, so that it may go well with you and so that you may go in and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to you and your ancestors, trusting all, trusting, thrusting out all of your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel passage for this morning is from the gospel according to Matthew, reading from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, verses 15 through 22. Let us listen for the word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. They sent their disciples to him along with the, with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Today's passage has entered into popular culture to the point that it's, it's almost ended up a cliche. Uh, we've all heard and said in the, and said in the context of talk about taxes and church and state and, and offerings, 
render unto Caesar. I heard a, I've heard even heard a TV evangelist use the scripture on U.S. money, uh, you know, uh, the inscription on U.S. money in God we trust as reason to send money to Him because we should render unto God the things that are God's. <laughs> Not a bad little ploy around stewardship time, I reckon. Anyway. What we've done is we've taken the words of Christ and we've made and made made them into platitudes. We've we've uh, taken the challenge and the judgment out and left a kind of lame prop that serves our self-interest. It's become a you know commercial slogan. This is this is a case of, of how we denigrate scripture by reducing it to a collection of sayings that we feel free to pull out and, and throw around at our leisure. I mean, we've all done it. Y'all do it. I do it. We all do it. That's just something we do. And this is one of those, this is one of those passages uh, that ends up uh, being used that way. Now, this passage, this story in the Bible is, is not primarily about paying taxes. It's about, it really is about seeing ourselves and our allegiances in the light of God's demand upon our lives and our resources. This passage challenges us to be awake to reality, to see the world in our place in, in the world, in the light of Christ's judgment and grace. Now, the context of this passage is a trap. It's, it, it, was a, it was a clever attempt by people opposed to Christ to put him in a no-win situation. Now, the political atmosphere back then wasn't that much different than it is now. And uh, so, uh, I mean, we can kind of appreciate what's going on here. There were certain issues which, uh, on which certain people could pray uh, and, and, and force another person into a, a position where they, they look bad to somebody. Now, today's issues, today's issues like abortion, homosexuals in society, civil rights, and feminist issues can all be used by unscrupulous and mean-spirited people to force a public person, a public figure, to say something that will get them into trouble. It happens all the time. Just wait till the debates start, uh, if you watch them. I don't. It's, it's, it's like being limited to yes or no answers when you're being asked something. Have you stopped beating your wife? Yes or no? You're going to go to jail one way or the other, okay? It's a no winner. There's no getting out of that one. Now, the same thing was going on with Jesus here. And the issue was, the issue that was the trap for Jesus was taxes. It's not, it's a pretty good trapping issue right now, by the way. Y'all know that. No matter how Jesus answered the question about taxes, he was going to make somebody angry. If Jesus simply said, well, it's our duty to the state to pay taxes, he was going to anger the Jewish patriots who saw the Roman occupation as an unbearable and chafing yoke on their freedom, on who they were. In the, eye, and then in the eyes of most people then, Jesus would have been a sellout. He would have, you know, he would have been a collaborator. And if Jesus had said, no, no, we should not cooperate with our oppressors by paying taxes, then the Romans and their supporters, who were called the Herodians, would have immediately arrested him as a revolutionary. Either way, 
the problem was solved for the Pharisees and the Herodians. So they had him. They thought, boy, we got him in a corner. He's, he's, he has cooked his own goose. Ain't nothing he can say to get out of it. Now what Jesus did in response, and his response was not only to pull a clever kind of table-turning uh, dodge to the trap, he actually took control of the situation and exposed the hypocrisy of his questioners. They wanted the conversation to stay on a secular level. They wanted Jesus to socially cut his own throat. Instead, Jesus made the situation one that focused on the faith allegiance of his questioners. Now, to understand what Jesus did, we need to understand something about the historical context here. Roman coins were minted in the likeness of the emperor. In, in this case, it was Tiberius. And, and, they, all, and they had an inscription on them. They had, uh, there was a couple of them. Either Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, the high priest, or Tiberius Caesar, the majestic son of God, the high priest. In the view of the pious Jews, the image and inscriptions were, they were violations of the commandments that we have no other God before us, before the Lord, and, pro, and the prohibition against graven images. Because of this, because of this problem, the Jewish kingdom, well, Herod's, uh, Herod's administration, uh, they had printed their own coinage without these offending images and without these words on them. Now, there was more hassle involved in using and carrying around this less uh, offensive money and, uh, because, you know, you just can't spend it anywhere. You had, to, you had to spend it in certain spots and only in Israel or in Judea and it probably mostly around Jerusalem. And so it was a hassle to carry this money around. And if, because it was a hassle, it was held to be a mark of piety to have only these Herodian coins in your pocket. And this was the only money that was fit to be used in the temple. And this, is, by the way, is why you had money changers in the temple. You brought your Roman coins. They would change your Roman coins with, with, you know, with, the, with good money, with the proper money, uh, and, and, they, and, and supposedly they took a cut, and that which was a, was a problem and got Jesus in a problem later on. Anyway, anyway, when the folks who were questioning Jesus reached in their purse, or I don't think they had pockets back then, but when they reached in the pouch where they kept their money and willingly showed their Roman coins engraved with the image of one who claimed to be a god, they showed that they had compromised themselves to the cultural reality of the time. This idolatrous coinage was more widely accepted and therefore easier to spend, and it made their secular life less complicated. The political reality was that functioning within the Roman Empire was more rewarding if he just simply turned a blind eye and accepted some of the idolatry of the state and spent their money on your stuff. The Pharisees and the Herodians who confronted Jesus showed that they accepted their political reality they ex and their cultural reality. And, they, and, and, and Jesus pointed out that they should pay their dues to that reality. That is, taxes to the Romans. The fact of the matter is, is that as long as we live in this world, we are all compromised by our participation in the life of the secular world. We cannot escape that fact. That is the that is reality. If we drive on a paved highway, we, part, we partake in the benefits 
of citizenship within our country, and we are participants in the strengths and weaknesses of our country. Even if we were to cloister ourselves away in a religious community, away from all the temptations of the secular world, we would find ourselves beholden to the culture that is willing to ensure our religious privilege to do that. We are still participating in the world around us. We don't have the convenience of moving God in and out of the picture as it suits because we are because if we are in it for a pence, we are in it for a pound as far as the world is concerned. So if we talk about God and in some situations, we kind of need to talk about God in all situations. The Lord is not our tool uh, to use to, to draw a line and uh, in our participation when we, when we don't want to pay the price for our, uh, for our lives in the secular world. We can't say, well, Jesus doesn't want me to pay taxes to you. He wants me to pay taxes to him or to me, to the preacher or something like that. That's not how that works. And, G and you're not going to draw God into that argument. And uh, Jesus has already shown he's not on our side when we do stuff like that. Because, by the way, he said, yes, you should pay your taxes to Caesar. That's the bottom line there. You can't get around it. When Jesus challenged his question as to render under, unto God, he was not drawing lines between our secular responsibilities and our, and our religious ones. Do we really think that the Son of God was telling us that, that there are some areas in our lives where God does not rule, where our faith has no say? Our worldliness, our taking part in the culture has become the issue. It has become the context in which we approach Christ. We, wanna, we would like to cry, uh, trap Christ into letting us off the hook uh, for that part of our lives, uh, which we give to the secular world, uh, we, but we do so, and we, when we try to do so, we hide in our pocket uh, the coin with Caesar's image on it. In our, and, and we don't want to acknowledge our compromise to the sinfulness of the world and we think that Jesus doesn't notice. What we're called to see is that, that, that all we have, all that we are, and all that we will be are to be rendered unto the Father. There is nothing that we can legitimately hold back from God. And if we make concessions to the world, we do so knowing that we are, we are withholding from the Lord. That's the nature of human life. Of life within a human culture that is, that is not sinless, no matter how much we try to tell ourselves otherwise. We, we must see that all that, that all that we are, all that we do, is under God's dominion and God's judgment. There is no untainted issue. No completely Christian position. Because we are condemned by the coin of convenience that we all carry in our pockets as human beings in the need of God's grace. Drawing Jesus, drawing the church and our faith into a political issue and trying to whitewash it, paint it over as somehow okay, as somehow untainted, just won't work. Jesus knows us. He knows us better than that. We've got to accept the ambiguity of human life. I think we kind of need to look at ourselves in this election season. What are the ways we're trying to trap Jesus? 
when we use Christ's name in our political language and choices, aren't we asking him to climb on board with us and our party? Haven't we come to Jesus with our agenda in place and assuming that he will agree with us? And if by chance someone disagrees with us, aren't they really unchristian un or non-Christian? Jesus is going to ask us if we are free from complic our complicity with our culture, and we're going to have to recognize that there's a coin in our pocket. And that coin shows that we, our allegiance are split. Then we, might, then we might find that our hope is not in being pure in the eyes of a party or the folks who agree with our ideology. Rather, our hope lies in the gracious Lord who sees us as we really are. And really, that's where our hope lies. In Christ, God has placed his grace right here within the context of our sinfulness. Even as we give in to the demands of the world, Christ is here. He's here to show us our error and offer us the means to overcome the condemnation of our error. It's not an option. We don't have the option to remove ourselves from the world. But it is possible to see that somehow our lives within the world can be rendered unto God in the faith. As people of faith, we are to see that the world is a place of sin. That's the reality of Christian insight, of Christian sight. But we're, be hum we're to be humble enough to recognize yeah, we got, we're, we're a part of that. We're party to it. The solution we seek is not to make the world agree with our view of godliness, but to seek to repent its ungodliness to the same Lord who has forgiven us. Our witness to the world is not the false offering of issues, issues that we proclaim holy. Our witness is the new life that Christ offers us in the face of unholiness, of our unholiness. Our hope lies only within the forgiveness of God, for, for that alone can change the deadly cycles that the, that the world offers us. We are in the midst of a struggle right now. Of course, everybody says it's gotten worse. and It really hasn't. This has always been this way. I have unfortunately, I guess unfortunately, when I walk moonshine, I listen to podcasts. I've listened to the ancient history of Rome, or the history of ancient Rome, the history of ancient Egypt, and I'm listening now to the history of ancient China. We have been mean and ornery and deadly for millennia, for millennia. The, the history of China starts in 3000 B.C. And we haven't changed. That's the context in which the grace of Jesus Christ hits us. Where we have been, where we have always been. Now we hope that peace will have a chance. That peace will reign someday. But we have got to recognize that that day has not come and that Jesus Christ shows us our part in it. He wakes us up to see our part in it and empowers us to try to make a difference. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the difficult and painful insight that comes with the faith. We thank you because it opens our eyes. It opens our eyes to who we are, but it also opens our eyes to possibilities. 
Help us to always appreciate that part of grace is judgment and part of judgment is insight. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me find myself. Let us join together uh, in worship by standing and singing together hymn number 697, Take My Life. join together in saying what we believe by saying together the Apostles' Creed as it is printed in your bulletins. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is wracked by violence and injustice, hatred, and just downright meanness. We pray that you will open our eyes 
to the reality of the world, not so that we would be descend into despair or frozen in inactivity, but that we may see our part in this dilemma and also that we may see our part in easing the pain of people. We ask that you will be with the folk, the people of the Middle East, the people of Israel who have suffered another senseless attack. Give them, give them strength, give them hope, but also give them, we pray, a, a sense of proportion. May, they, may their response not be driven so by hate that innocent, that innocent lives are, are just thrown away. This is one of those situations in which there is absolutely no solid ground on which just to stand and, and point a finger. Help us to somehow decide just not to kill anymore. Dear God, we also ask that you will be with the folks of the Ukraine. Give them strength and hope. Be with the people of Russia that they may see clearly the hurt, the evil that's being done here. And we ask that you'll be with the church in Russia and in the Ukraine. Lift from them the mistake of equating their faith with their country. And may they become a, a, a voice of peace in both countries. Dear God, we ask that you will be with the United States. We sometimes can't get it right, oftentimes can't get it right, but a lot of times we can make a difference to the positive. Help us to see those opportunities. Help us to take them. Help us not to be afraid to involve ourselves in the lives of other people. When the, when the temptation is to turn inward, help us to turn outward. We are not blessed with resources and talent to keep it to ourselves. Help us to see that. And dear God, be with our community here that as we approach decisions uh, within our government locally, that we do so with grace and humility and with love as we are called to live as Christians. Be with the folks who are ill, give them strength and give them hope. May they know that their illness, that their pain is not singling out that they're not judged especially because they hurt this is a human frailty that we all share that our Lord shared when he knew the pain of crucifixion stand beside them and give them peace and hope and for those who mourn may the promise of the resurrection of life in God guide a, guide the mourners, guide those who sorrow to a place where they can remember their loved ones with joy and in, do so, in doing so, honor them. Guide your church. We often worry about our existence, but if we follow you, you promise to make more of us than we than we are. And may that be a source of hope and encouragement. And be with the folks in this congregation as they move forward. May they do so in hope, knowing that you stand beside them, 
and that you will for their health and their goodness. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are the people of God. And the Lord has given us grace upon grace. We have received life in abundance. Let us worship our Lord by returning a portion of God's gift for the service of the kingdom in Christ's name. Let us worship God through our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, accept these, our gifts and offerings, and we pray that you will take these gifts and offerings, make more of them than we could imagine in sharing your kingdom with this world. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in singing our final hymn, uh, hymn number 611, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, be with you always. Amen. <laughs> David, this morning. <laughs> it is. He actually does get all credit and the fact that I am even volunteering within the presbytery. He, he definitely gave me the encouragement to do this years ago. All right, guys. The purpose of our meeting today is the election of elders and trustee. If there are any visitors, which I think they've already exited, but if they are, you guys are welcome to stay and observe. Do we have a quorum presence? Perfect. Well, then I call this meeting to order. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love that is steadfast and everlasting. We seek to love and serve one another, and today we ask that you guide us so that the decisions may be pleasing in your sight. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite John up to read the slate of nominees on behalf of the nominating committee. All right. Good morning. Uh, there are three slates that I will be reading through. The first slate is for the class of 2025 elder, and that's Stacy Johnson. The second slate is is for the trustee of the class of 2026, and that's Bill Morelli. The third slate is for four elders for the class of 2026, and they are Earl Davis, Carolyn Stewart, John Frazier, and Damon Rogers. And those are also printed in the bulletin if you missed anything. Thank you. You have heard the recommendation. Are we ready to vote? Yes. We're going to take this one slate at a time. As for the elder class of 2025, the recommendation is Stacy Johnson. Are there any nominations from the floor? Hearing none, let's proceed to the votes. Is there a, not a motion to approve the elder in nomination? Is there a second? Correct. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Recommendation is approved. As for the trustee, class of 2026, the recommendation is Bill Morelli. Are there any nominations from the floor? Hearing none, let's proceed to the vote. Is there a motion to approve trustee and nomination? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. As for the elders, class of 2026, the recommendation. 
congratulations are Earl Davis, Caroline Stewart, John Frazier, and Damon Rogers. Are there any nominations from the floor? I have a nomination. Uh, I nominate Deborah Vanderbilt. Deborah Vanderbilt, do you accept the nomination? I do. Additional nominations? I have a nomination. Uh, Lynn Welch, she's not here today or out of town today, but she was agreed to be here. So, as exceptional. Additional nominations from the floor? Okay. This vote is going to take place silently. So we will need to gather some blank pieces of paper. If you have a writing utensil with you, if you will pull that out. If you are visiting, I do ask that you only observe for the congregational vote. of 2026, please add these two names to the slate as you see it. Deborah Vandeveer and Lynn Welsh. Spelling will not be counted. <laughs> Okay, blank slips of paper are going to be passed out. I ask that you write four names on that sheet of paper as you receive it. First and last names. Okay, if we have a need for pencils, just raise your hand and as they're passing that out, they can give you both paper and pencil. Once everybody has a slip of paper, I'll allow you three to five minutes to write down your selections. Again, you are selecting four names. Okay, please raise your hand if you have not received a piece of paper or if you are in need of a writing utensil. Let's not forget the choir. <laughs> I think we've got a few more that need papers. Guys, you have three minutes to record your names. Four names, please, first and last.
If I can get two or three tellers to collect the votes and tally those. Votes are being collected. If you'll just kind of hold those. Any other? Just do it right here on the front.
like a Presbyterian meeting. <laughs>
thank you for your patience. The class of 2026 elder elects are as follows. Earl Davis, John Frazier, Caroline Stewart, and Lynn Welsh. With there being no other business at today's meeting, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. You voted, you voted silently. Mm-hmm, you did. Is there a motion to adjourn? All right, is there a second? All in favor, please stand and let's close in prayer. We give thanks for your presence with us today. We also give thanks for those who willingly hear the call to serve your kingdom. May our lives continue to be shaped by the word and empowered by the spirit as we grow more and more each day into your image. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. I'll take this opportunity to remind session. Stick with us for a few more minutes. If you are a member of the session, if we can meet back in the fellowship hall for a few minutes. <laughs>